Okay, we're ready to go. We're ready to go? Ready to go, yeah. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will be chairing the next two sessions, and I want to apologize to the speakers ahead of time if I mispronounce their names. And I would ask if I do say your name incorrectly to please say your name to everyone so that I can at least learn. Um, for next time. Um, so the, our first talk is a contributed 15 minute talk by Athira Menon, uh, talking about the impacts of binary mergers on core collapse supernova and their progenitors. Okay, I'll share my screen. Great. Uh, I hope you see my screen now. Great, okay. Well, uh, let me first thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my work at this workshop. My name is Atira Menon. I'm a Juan de la Sierra Fellow at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. So it's a good evening here from Tenerife. Um, we all know that massive stars um, live in binary systems wherein most of them interact with their companions as they progress over time but a significant fraction of them also end up merging while they're still stars. What are the imprints of these binary mergers on the observed stellar population in the HR diagram? And how do they contribute to the diversity of core collapse supernovae that we observe? These are the questions I'll try to tackle in the work I'm going to present today. Um, before continuing, I would like to give a shout out to my collaborators on this work. Um, from the IAC in Tenerife, uh, the Massive Star Research Group that's led by Sergio Simon Diaz. He's an observer and provides me with the data that I need. And uh, from the Argolanda Institute of Astronomy at the University of Bonn, uh, the group led by Norbert Langer. In particular, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Andrea Colinio, who is a PhD student there and uh, is programming uh, some of the things over here with me. Now, let us continue the story. We always love to go back to our favorite supernova 1987A, and it's, it's a wonderful coincidence that I'm giving this talk uh, with, uh, at this workshop here. 87A, of course, is one of um, Chandra's favorite objects to observe. We still, to this date, look at how this, uh, the shockwave from the supernova continues to interact with the circumstellar medium around it. Um, and it's a question still of what kind of remnant this event left behind in, its, uh, in the center over there. But 35 years ago, what really astonished astronomers everywhere was the fact that while this event was expected to be that typical type two hydrogen rich supernova, when they dug up the uh, photographic plates that actually had the image of the progenitor star, they found out that it was not the extended red supergiant um, that they expected it to be. It was in fact a compact, hot, blue supergiant, only about 50 or so solar radii across. What led to the origin of a blue star to explode as a type two event? Well, today it's more or less uh, an established um, fact that the only way to explain the origin of a blue supergiant that explodes like 87A, or for that matter, a type two event, is from a binary merger. That is two stars that were locked in a binary system, merged at some point in their lives, and then the evolution of that post-merger object led to the collapse of a blue supergiant. Um, this image you see here is an evolutionary track from my PhD thesis, where I worked exclusively on the progenitors of 87A-like objects. Um, now there were attempts for uh, doing this via the single star approach, but for many reasons, they did not quite uh, accommodate all the signatures of the observed uh, progenitor. And most importantly, the light curve shape as well. We all know how the light curves are very sensitive um, to the structure of the star, the density profile and the chemical profile of the uh, pre-supernova model. So to get such a beautiful fit, was um, really one of a kind and could only explain, could only be explained from a post-merger star. 
Now we extended this work a little bit and tried to see other kind of um, 87A like objects as well. And we found that in fact, for two others, um, again, these blue supergiants from post mergers uh, actually did explain the light curve shapes there as well, which was all very promising. Now, um, my PhD work exclusively focused on 87A like objects, but I did extend the parameter space a little bit more to see what other kind of um, progenitors can we get from binary star mergers. And here is the result of that. You see that across the HR diagram, the position of the pre-supernova models just before the onset of core collapse strewn across the HR diagram over different uh, effective temperatures and luminosities as well. So this now formed uh, the foundation and the motivation of the work that I have embarked on here at the Institute of Astrophysics, which is to do a more systematic and detailed study of post-merger objects um, across the binary parameter space. To start this work, I needed a grid of detailed models that have already been computed. Here is a sample of that grid. It was uh, done by Pablo Marchin during his PhD thesis at the University of Bonn, uh, and it's now part of the Bonn uh, database right now. Um, these are all binary models, right? And what you see here is a slice across the grid you see the initial period on the y-axis, the mass ratio of two stars on the x-axis. And this particular uh, space here is for a primary star of 16 solar masses. Of interest to me are the kind of binary stars that will end up merging, which is marked across um, this picture over here. So that is the grid across which I will be performing my post-merger simulations. A fourth parameter is actually missing in this grid, which is the time. That is, when does the merging event occur? And that is also, of course, available from the grid itself. The grid, uh, the models in this particular grid are stopped uh, just at the onset of a merger or when we expect there to be a merger. And I will be taking the story forward through the merger all the way across to the end uh, or the beginning rather of ion core collapse. Right. So here is the um, merger that occurred, likely occurred, that led to the explosion of 87A. We start with, the, this is a cartoon image, of course, and it's adapted from uh, Philip Podsiedlowski's work uh, from the early 90s when he proposed this scenario. And uh, his then student, Natasha Ivanova, actually did the 3D merger simulations uh, during her PhD work. So we start off with a pair of stars on the main sequence, the more massive star is called the primary. At some point when this more massive star puffs up and acquires a helium depleted core, that is after burning helium in the core, it transfers mass to the less massive star. At this point, the mass transfer is, is unstable. So the less massive star, the secondary gets engulfed in the envelope of the primary and this leads to a common envelope episode. Now, some of this mass is lost from the surface because the secondary star slowly starts to spiral in towards the core of the primary. At the same time as it spirals in, it also loses some of its material towards the helium core of the primary. And as a result, the secondary star slowly dissolved inside this envelope of the primary star. Eventually what you get is at the end of, a mer of the merger, a very massive envelope, rich in hydrogen, little bit enhanced in helium, and a small helium core. This structure is unstable thermally, so it will expand a bit and then begin to slowly go towards the blue end of the HR diagram where it will collapse as a blue supergiant. And this particular scenario I've shown you here is for 87A. But now I'm going to apply the same physics to the binary parameter space I showed you earlier and look, let's look at what kind of uh, results we get by uh, applying this method to them as well. Now, um, these are preliminary results because this is only over the last couple of months that we actually managed to implement a 1D merger mixing scenario into MESA. Earlier I used Kepler, this is a different stellar evolution code. And I'm going to show you an animation of the evolutionary track as it whizzes across the HR diagram of a binary system which merges. 
So the pink line there is the secondary, the blue one is the primary. There it begins the merger, slowly acquires mass. We are looking at a star that's 14.7 solar masses dissolving and merging with the 15.8 solar mass star. It's gonna take some time. Roughly around 2000 years is what the time scale of the merger is in this particular case. And then it zooms across and ends its life um, in, in the square, in that red circle you saw there. So that little uh, box that says helium core burning should have come up a little bit earlier. Essentially what I want to say here is that this star is a blue supergiant while burning helium in its core and ends its life as a blue supergiant as well. And that is when core collapse occurs. So this will look like um, 87A quite likely. Of course, we have to uh, perform the light curve analysis to affirm this, um, but it's likely that it will explode like that. Um, here, you actually also see in parallel the uh, final abundance profile, the surface abundances of the star uh, that explodes uh, in this particular case. Um, and you can see what a massive uh, hydrogen rich envelope exists um, over the small helium core, which is only about 5.2 solar masses here. Um, the total lifetime of this star in, from this particular model um, during the blue supergiant phase is about one and a half million years. What that means is there is a likelihood we can actually see these blue supergiants that come from mergers in the local cosmic neighborhood. If they are living long enough to be caught while they're still blue stars. Um, do all mergers lead to blue supergiant explosions? Well, the, the answer to that question is no. Actually, it depends upon the masses of the components involved and also when the merging occurs. So on the top there, you see the case I showed you earlier, the animation where you can see the blue dot showing you where the explosion will occur. But um, on the other hand, here is a slightly less massive star. Um, and the merging in this case happens much later along the life of the star. So in this case, the system does not explode as a blue star supergiant, but in fact, whizzes across and returns back to explode as a red supergiant. Nonetheless, what does happen with this star is that it does spend about 0.14 million years as a Hertzsprung gap star. Now, if we go back to our textbooks, uh, the Hertzsprung gap is supposedly that empty region in the HR diagram. You're not supposed to find any stars. But we have observations now from the Milky Way that show us that, in fact, the Hertzsprung gap is littered with at least some stars. Are these post-merger stars? We need to find this out in more detail. Um, and that blue region I have circled in the same diagram over there are blue supergiants. Are these helium core burning stars? Are they still burning helium in their cores? Have they just come from a primary merger? We need to ascertain that as well. But it is likely that we are observing post-merger stars amongst the massive stars in the cosmic neighborhood. Finally, um, we would like to, I would like to just talk to you a little bit about the other um, signatures of post-mergers. Um, it's not only their positions in the HR diagram, um, but if you look at the nitrogen over carbon ratio in the surface, um, they are severely enhanced about seven times more than what you would expect from a single star of the same mass. Um, in this particular case, you see the single star, of course, is that beautiful line in green, um, and the other two tracks are from the mergers. So enhancement in nitrogen over carbon and also nitrogen over oxygen may be a sign of a post-merger star as well. Uh, I would like to flag one thing at this point that um, the evolution of a star in general, and specifically in the case of binaries, is very, very sensitive to the wind prescriptions that we use. And of course, we know this in particular for massive stars and uh, the opacities that we use as well, which will determine the final structure, the density profile, the helium uh, core to envelope mass ratio, et cetera, which in turn will affect the nucleosynthesis yields and the light curve properties uh, from the explosion of these models. So to conclude, I would like to say that stellar mergers are indeed very, very important. Uh, they are 
so far not a well explored uh, phenomenon. We don't have models that are built from detailed analysis, um, but this is the work I will be doing over the year, next year or so in collaboration with a great team of people. And um, I hope to keep you all posted with the, the results we get. Thank you very, very much. Have time for one question. We have a question on on. Um, I saw something on Slack. On Slack from uh, Craig Wheeler. What do you think about the prospect that Fatal Juice had a merger? <laughs> um, I don't know. I would love to uh, get some uh, data about it uh, in the first place before answering that. Um, for example, the abundance uh, signatures on the surface of the star. Um, that would be something to do to actually explore. I do think, though, there are some works that have already investigated this. I haven't read them in detail, looking at Betelgeuse from a stellar merger perspective. But if there are these enhancements in nitrogen over carbon, for example, it is likely this too came from a stellar merger. Thank you again. Um, we have Thank you very much. Right, so the next uh, five talks are five minute lightning talks. So in order to give the speakers more time for their talks, we're not going to take questions after each talk, but please include your questions on uh, Slack and continue the discussion there. So. Um, next, next we have Mackenzie Ferrari talking about synthetic spectroscopy of type one A supernovae. All right, um, so hi everyone. I'm a uh, Mackenzie Ferrari. I am a now senior undergrad at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Um, I work with my advisor, uh, Bob Fisher, on modeling potential progenitor systems of type 1a supernovae in particular. Um, so this is actually some work that we uh, just recently published, uh, I think back in February, um, related to uh, a near Chandra Zaker mass wet dwarf developing from the double degenerate channel. Um, so just to kind of give an overview of what this model even is, um, we are essentially proposing a new model for the origin of near Chandra mass type 1a supernovae. Um, so instead of originating from the canonical single degenerate channel, which has some issues, um, we're actually suggesting that the majority of these near Chandra mass type 1a supernovae develop instead from the double degenerate channel. And so just to start, um, you essentially start with uh, two binary white dwarfs um, that essentially in spiral, losing energy and angular momentum in the process. And then eventually the secondary uh, experience is a tidal disruption. And so after this uh, disruption, within a few minutes, uh, the remnant of the secondary forms a disk around the primary. Um, and so this is actually a key part in our model is that there's actually a differential rotation within the disk itself. Um, and that causes a, uh, a magneto rotational instability or an MRI. Um, and so that's a very key part to this model. Um, so after a while, this model will then uh, spin up and then spin down. It'll eventually enter the propeller phase in order to lose angular momentum. Um, and then eventually after it undergoes multiple cycles of ejection, um, it then results in a highly magnetized uh, primary because it's been induced a magnetic field has been induced within the primary due to the presence of an MRI within the envelope surrounding it. So again, this is the key element for producing a near Schoenner-Zaker mass model uh, from this uh, evolution is the magnetic field that is then induced within the primary. So our goal is to then recreate the observable signatures of a type 1a supernovae. Um, and so to do that, um, actually, uh, Evo, uh, uh, summarizes very well our process, um, but we start with a hydrostatic model of a carbon oxygen white dwarf, and we run it into, up until a uh, small of this expansion. And then we measure the abundances of about 500 different isotopes. And so we end up with a uh, synthetic spectrum. Um, and so here I'm just comparing uh, our model, which is in black um, against just a, a regular type 1a um, event 99 BE. Um, so you can see, um, we've done a lot of tests that our model highly correlates, not just to type 1a in general, but also specifically to the subtype 1a normal. Um, so to 
go right to consistency with observations. Um, so our model is consistent with existing observations, particularly the absence of companion and ex-companion signatures, um, as well as um, the remnants themselves are also highly spherical, which we've kind of expected. Um, and without that predicted shadow from the uh, the companion. Um, I do have a very brief uh, table of some of the uh, important ratios, like uh, manganese to iron, nickel to iron, and they're notably high um, in the solar abundance range. But these values are consistent with remnants such as 3C397. Um, uh, all right. There is also, uh, when we were compiling this research, um, there was the highly magnetized white dwarf found, the ZTFJ1, et cetera. Um, that is a rapidly rotating, highly magnetized white dwarf that actually has very similar uh, properties to the, the uh, types of um, configurations we're talking about in this uh, work. Um, so based on a lot of uh, other research that we went into, um, binary population synthesis, delay time distributions, um, we actually suggest that our near Chandra's acre mass model um, accounts for about 12 to 21% of all type 1A events. Um, so we think it's a pretty significant uh, uh, rate. Um, and so that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Kenzie. So please uh, include your questions on, on Slack. Um, and we'll move right ahead to No Soaker talking about the role of jets and including supernovae and shaping their remnants. This is an online poem. No, you can start sharing your slides. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay, so this is going to be a review talk because uh, every talk I give in English is a review because if you translate soccer to English, it's review. And if you translate Noam to English, it's pleasantness. So this is going to be a pleasantness review on the role of jets in exploding supernovae and in shaping the remnant. So. The talk is based on a review that I posted and was accepted for publication by Astro PH a week ago. I'm very pleased that it was accepted by Astro PH. So first of all, I, I would like to say I'm very happy to be Zoom back in the CFA where I was a postdoc many years ago where I was John Raymond. Um, hi, John. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with 87.8 has a structure of three rings. Um, and the first suggestion actually for a common envelope evolution in 87A, as far as I know, in my paper with Roger Chevalier, where we uh, proposed the common envelope evolution of 87A to explain the asymmetrical explosion. If you look at the three wings of 87A, you can find a very similar structure in planetary nebulae. As you can see on the lower uh, rows, here on the right, I show a structure of uh, several rings on the polar lines. And then when we look on a larger area and deep, we see jets. Look at the ring here and another planetary nebula, you see broken ring in the equatorial plane, like the broken ring 87A. When you look outside, we see jets. So I claim that the three wings of 87A were shaped by jets. Let us go to see other planetary nebulae. We see a planetary nebulae with jets and they, you see opening up on the right side, you see openings, jet openings. Here is a image that you see here is a JWST on the right, uh, on the right of second row. You see again kind of an ear. This ear uh, was shaped by jets. Here on the left, you see three images of a planetary nebula 3918. Again, jet shaped these ears. On the bottom, you see four supernova remnant with the same structure of ears. I bet they were shaped by jets. Let's continue. Here you see three planetary nebulae that show jets and kind of ball shape, two arcs. But these arcs is, a, is actually, a, you know, axis symmetrical structure. On the upper left, you see uh, the same ball structure of a supernova remnant. I bet this was shaped by jets. Again, you see here ears on the lower uh, left, but you see here I concentrate on the arcs, and clearly you see jet in this planetary nebula, same shape as a supernova remnant, shaped by jets. 
Here is a supernova uh, that Josephine Larson showed us yesterday. This is, you see here, point symmetric structure on a slit in the velocity plane. Position velocity, velocity plane, you see kind of opposite structure. This is called point symmetry. For each blob, you see blob on the other side, different lines present different blob. On the lower row, you see different planetary nebulae with point symmetric. Look at the lower right. You see blobs, point symmetric. This, in the planetary nebulae, we know these were shaped by jets. I bet the structure of this supernova remnant was shaped by jets. Here you see type 1a supernovae. And this supernova, you see also here, so on the, the left column are supernova remnants 1a, right are planetary nebulae, with small ears, I showed you large ears. And here I don't think the explosion is by, by jets, no. I think here you have supernovae that exploded into a circumstellar medium, like in Kepler. In all the three, we think we have, we think we have circumstellar medium, and I think it was a planetary nebulae in the core degenerate scenario. In the previous talk, the speaker mentioned 100 years of delay, common envelope, a merger to explosion delay, 100 years, it can be 10 to the four years also. And this is what I think happened here. We have common envelope merger of the core with the white dwarf. And then after 1,000 years or 10,000 years, it exploded into a planetary a nebula. So my summary is, uh, please go to the Slack. There is a channel called Polls. Go there and vote if you think or not. You don't need to agree with me. But please express your view. And what do you think about JET? And, and as you can see, um, this is VH3H1. This is a merger, new result by Tomek Kaminsky. He showed it on, only in meetings, also showed this has a bipolar structure. These gap objects also are shaped by J, definitely this planetary nebulae. Thank you, I finished. Thank you, Dr. Kaminsky. Uh, we have time for one more talking about simulating late stages of merger birth. So uh, thank you for having me. My name is Amir and this work was done with uh, Amit Kashi. And uh, this work was focused actually on supernova in Poser. So uh, these objects are called uh, intermediate luminous optical transient on short eyelot. And we focus specifically on a, a object that's called red luminous nova or a, a merger or merger burst of two stars. So I will shortly explain what is an eye lot and then I uh, will show why thick accretion disk is, is the natural choice to simulate the late stages of this mod of these objects and uh, uh, the result of uh, our simulation. So eye lot is a, a, a you can think of ILOT as, as the main feature of, of, of this object is that they are uh, powered by gravitational energy. And um, they do have a peak luminosity between uh, nova and supernova, so in the energy gap. Uh, I think the main thing is that they are uh, powered by gravitational energy and not uh, a, a thermonuclear or some other energy. And a luminous red nova are actually a merger of two stars. So if you have two stars that are uh, closing in one on another, uh, uh, coming in, in they, they are um, uh, rotating one in another, and then the primary will distract the secondary. So the primary is the more dense one, the secondary is the less dense ones. And uh, after this uh, stage that the primary distract the secondary, what we will have is a, a, a lot of matter a, a surrounding the primary in the shape of, of some kind of a, a thick disk or, or a, a, a donut-like shape. And uh, if we look at the light curve, so to the right, we can see a, 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 a lot of island objects that have a very similar a, features in the light curve. They usually have more than one peak and a, a sharp decline. So what we uh, suggest is that the, the, the more than one peak after the rise 
is actually the coalition stage when the two stars are closing in one another and, 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 and the primary is destruct the secondary. And after this stage, you have this uh, um, thick disk that is unstable and it started to, uh, 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 this, this disk started to destruct, it started to collapse. And, and, and in the collapse, it's actually ejected matters and this is the sharp decline. So to uh, the left, we see V3 moon uh, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's V3 moon, it's, it's actually uh, some kind of uh, a prototype for this class of objects. So what we did, we use a flash simulation and uh, we simulate matter with uh, radiation using opal opacities. We use uh, self-gravity and point mass, and we use cooling, and we added some kind of feedback mechanism in order to account for the accretion uh, um, energy. And what we uh, get is this nice result that we see here. So in, in the upper panel, we see the temperature. In the lower panel, we see the luminosity. And we see here uh, two lines of sites for a result of our simulation, that is the, the spiky lines here. And we see that it's fit well between a other, a, 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 a other lines of, a, of, from the observations. And we, if we uh, zoom in specifically for V3 moon, so for V3 moon, we see here the, a, the green line with the, the red uh, marks that uh, uh, correspond for uh, uh, actual observations. And uh, in the middle panel, we can see uh, the temperature are in a very good agreement with our simulations. And we have nice uh, agreement with the luminosity and, and radius as well. And uh, if we go further on into some uh, hydrodynamics uh, results, so here we can see the um, uh, edge on point of view of, of the system and uh, on the uh, upper uh, leftmost uh, uh, panel, we can see uh, the starting point of the simulation, the disk that are in the center. And as the simulation evolved over time, we can see that it's created these uh, uh, jets uh, in uh, uh, along the poles and, and a very nice equatorial ejecta. Uh, the uh, jet are actually have, if you can see here, actually have this uh, kind of uh, a cocoon like uh, stratified structure, and the ejecta have this uh, blob like structure. And if we do a zoom in, so we can see the destruction of uh, uh, actually the, uh, how the disk itself is evolved over time, how it's uh, uh, collapsing and, and, uh, and then uh, inflated and shrink and so on. So I think my time is up. Thank you. Exactly on time. Thank you. All right. Next we have Muhammad Akashi telling us about light curves of jet-driven bipolar core plot supernovae. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about light curves of jet-driven bipolar co a collapse supernovae. This work was done by me, Amir Mikaelis, and Noam Sokir. Uh, we mainly do a numerical simulation using flash code. So we build a bipolar explosion by three numerical phases through the hydrogen, in the hydrodynamical simulation. Uh, these phases might result from a common envelope evolution. However, for the present study, the only important phase is the general bipolar explosion with dense equatorial gas and fast bipolar outflows. Then we can obtain the light curve after we have the density and velocity and other hydrodynamical quantities uh, and can compare with the light curves from observations of Rayleigh supernovae. Uh, the motivation was after uh, the toy model that uh, was done by uh, Noah Kaplan and Noam Sokir, uh, in which they assumed the uh, two low density bubbles in the polar ejecta one at each side of the equatorial plane. So here we can see the blue line. Actually, this is the light curve of the low density from the toy model. Uh, and the red and green points are the light curves from the supernova 2018 in the R and G bands, respectively. So we uh, aim at a, a 
getting a, the, a, the same or similar light curve a, from our simulation. So here I show the density at the four times. These times actually after the explosion, the duration of the explosion is three days. So we start from 95 days and end with the 120 days. And the different colors actually for the density in log scale. I show here the temperature also on the log scale at the same four times. And here we have the velocity magnitude. So the different colors actually for the different uh, 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 values for the velocity and the arrows here for the directions of the velocity for also for the same times. And here we uh, want to obtain the light scales. So we calculate the magnitude by calculating the, uh, the photospheric area and then the luminosity while assuming constant photospheric temperature of 7,000 Kelvin, which is typical for supernovae. We use the following formula for the magnitude, this one, where L is calculated is the luminosity that is calculated according to sigma t to the four times the area of the photosphere as seen by the observer and the prescribed angle. And here I show the, our results from the numerical simulations. And we can uh, clearly see that for uh, angles, large angles, which mean a, a, an equatorial uh, observer. A, we, for example, here for theta equal 80, we get a pretty nice result, which we can uh, compare to the real observations from the, uh, for this supernovae. But that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So next we have Margarita Rosado. And the topic is mixed pathology supernova. Can can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, uh, good evening. I, I would like to talk about uh, uh, our research on mixed morphology remnants. This work is done with uh, these people th that are my collaborators. And uh, I would like to recall that the uh, mixed morphology remnants are a shell type um, in radio continuum. In the X-rays, they are field center. They are associated with molecular clouds. Uh, they have uniform radial distribution of temperature and density of the hot interior. And uh, we um, see that uh, the existence of molecular clouds with them uh, is, um, is an indication that they would have optical counterparts. Uh, the, the, the determination of the several properties from let me see. There are two main models, thermal conduction and evaporation of dense cloudlets, uh, the white and log model, and to explain the, the mixed morphology. And there is an important tool uh, developed by Leahy and Williams, uh, and a Python code that uh, allows to model different uh, scenarios, including a clumpy ISM. Uh, we, um, I will talk about the, the determination of several quantities from optical, spectroscopic, uh, and kinematic observations and X-rays. Uh, from optical, uh, one can get the kinematic distance in the case of galactic supernova remnants, which is quite inter important for um, for uh, galactic studies. From them, there, the linear diameter, the electron density of the cloudlets, and the uh, induced uh, shock velocity on the cloudlets. From X-rays, uh, you will have the electron temperature, the velocity of the primary shock wave, the age of the supernova remnants together with the linear diameter, the electron density of the interior and the initial energy deposited by in the ISM 
And the, with these quantities, one can uh, get uh, different models and to see how uh, applies better to the, to the parameters we obtained. In the case, for example, of the galactic supernova remnant W51, one, we succeeded to have the kinematical study of the optical counterpart of this, this supernova remnant, which is field, field center in X-ray, a shell type, and the, this corresponds to the field of the optical observations. And we succeeded to have the kinematic distance and to uh, study modeling uh, the best with the Lehian code and Williams code, uh, uh, having a cloudy ISM. The same with the, a supernova remnant in the large Magellanic clouds, uh, where we it corresponds to this part here, and this is the radial optical distribution in H alpha no three, and and with the X ray, we succeeded also to uh, to model with the in, with that tool. Uh, in conclusion. Uh, the two cases studied here are consistent with a supernova explosion interacting with dense cloudlets. Under that condition, optical emission should be detected unless high interstellar absorption hated. Optical lines are quite helpful to determine important remnant quantities combined with radio and X-ray. Many things. Um. So next we have Ashley. I want to say Crimp. Ashley, how do you pronounce your last name? Crimes. It's, like a, it's a silent okay. H. Great. Ashley Crimes, and will will tell us about predictions for runaway stars in the Age of Precise Cross Promotion Survey. Okay. Thanks. Let me share my screen. There we go. Right. Okay. Um, Hopefully you can see that okay. Yep. Okay, right, so uh, thanks to the organizer for giving me the chance to uh, give this um, talk at this meeting today. Now, yeah, so I'm Ashley, I'm a postdoc at Radboud University in the Netherlands, and I'd like to talk about the, uh, the binary companions to supernovae. So we expect around a third to half of all uh, natal neutron stars or supernova remnants to have a um, core clap supernova remnants to have an unbound companion. And what we can do now in the era of, of Gaia um, is that we can trace back the motions of stars in the field and see if any of them intersect the past trajectory of a young neutron star or a supernova remnant. Now, so an example of that on the right hand side here um, by Morgan Fraser from a paper back in 2019. Uh, and the green lines there are the past trajectories of, of stars in the field. Um, the black line is the past trajectory of the Vela um, pulsar. And you can look for things that overlap um, to try and identify uh, Ejected companions. And the question is, do the detection rates and the properties of these stars, if you find candidates for runaways, uh, agree with predictions? And so what we're working on at the moment is um, predictions using the BPAS binary population synthesis code. And for more de details on that, you can see um, Jan's talk yesterday. So an example of the kind of things you can predict. Um, so this plot on the bottom here is basically a color magnitude diagram um, with Gaia magnitude versus uh, color. Uh, essentially, what we have in each cell of this diagram um, is colored by the probability that the, uh, a runaway in this cell was ejected by a, a type 1BC or a type 2 supernova, uh, where blue is more likely to be a 1BC and red is more likely to be a type 2. And overlaid on here are four um, strong runaway candidates from a, um, a search of 13 supernova remnants by Bubert et al. 2017 and Fraser et al. 2019. And you can see that they line up quite well uh, in that parameter space. And um, we can also start to think about applying this to surveys. Um, and so what we've got in the top left are BPAS predictions for um, the Gaia absolute magnitude and the Gaia gene ma magnitude versus the uh, projected 2D um, velocity of the runaways, or just all unbound stars, not just runaways. And essentially, if you, if you know this and you have a distance and an extinction estimate to your supernova remnant or to your, your, your neutron star, and then in your survey, you know what your minimum measurable proper motion is, and you know what your um, 
the limiting magnitude is. You can work out what fracture that parameter space is accessible to you. And so this middle plot here, a um, little bit complicated, but I'll try to explain it. So we've got the white contours are the, um, that's the percentage of the magnitude distribution that's accessible to you. So it's the percentage of the, of the runaways that are bright enough to be seen in the survey. The shading in the background is the percentage of the 2D velocity distribution, which is measurable, given your minimum um, measurable uh, proper motion and your distance. And so what you can see is that for these 13 supernova remnants that I showed on the previous slide, um, they're basically clustered down in the bottom left, which for most cases means that if they had a, a companion that they've ejected, then you should be able to see it and you should be able to measure its motion. Now, if you also have an estimate for the binary fraction and the completeness of your survey, then you can ultimately estimate the probability in each case um, that you will detect a unbound companion or not. And so uh, applying this um, to these 13 supernova remnants, um, four of them had um, candidates reported in those previous two papers that I mentioned. Can we predict that around five should be found? Um, so that's in the reasonable agreement. Um, but going forwards, we want to tailor this um, to, the, to the magnitude and the proper motion on each individual line of sight, because this varies across the entire survey. And then ultimately, if you want to expand this out further into the Milky Way, um, or distant and dustier sight lines, then we really need to move to infrared. And so you can think about the, the VVV survey, which has proper motions, but the proper motions aren't as um, precise as you get with Gaia. Um, you can look at taking multiple epochs of deep HST imaging. And ultimately, you can do that also with James Webb in the future. And um, then one of the motivations for this is to apply this method to magnetars. Um, and I refer you to a paper that we recently published this year on looking for bound companions to magnetars uh, in Milky Way. Um, but if you do this, um, looking for unbound companions as well, which are expected to be much more numerous than bound companions, then this is potentially an interesting constraint on the progenitor systems of magnetars. So I'm coming up to my five minutes. Um, I'll finish there and I'll take any questions on Stack. Thank you. Next, we have Siparia Kuroza talking about the Cygnus loop, a multi wavelength perspective. We can't hear you if you're speaking. Can you unmute yourself? I'm so sorry. I was muted. Okay. So I'm talking to you from Bangalore, India. And I'll be talking about uh, our program on observing the Cygnus loop. Our main aim of the program was to study it in the ultraviolet uh, band using, uh, using the far ultraviolet filters on the AstroSat UVIT instruments. But since AstroSat observes also in the X-ray band, we've done several X-ray, soft X-ray observations of this loop. And I'll be talking to you about several segments that we've looked at and reduced recently. So, I've got some of my favorite images out over here below. You can see the kind of uh, images and resolution that we are getting from UVIT. The image on the right is a composite image consisting of UVIT and UV, which is in red, and two far ultraviolet uh, uh, bands, uh, F172M, F154W. And uh, one can clearly see that there are regions showing clear far ultraviolet excess which, as you will see in the subsequent uh, talk, sometimes ends up being superposed on regions which are showing charge exchange uh, excess in the X-ray spectra. So moving on to my next slide, well, Cygnus is pretty well known as a fairly large, fairly nearby, very well evolved. Um, and because it's nearby, large angular size uh, supernova remnant, it's an archetypal example of a supernova taking place in a massive star, which has carved out a cavity from the interstellar medium due to the very strong, very bright illumination from it. So it's basically an archetypal case of expansion into cavity created by progenitor winds. And I've marked out over here the regions that we've been looking at recently. So these uh, four regions over here, which cover the southern segment of the Cygnus loop. And then there's this one segment in the eastern veil that we have been looking at over here. And uh, a quick look at the 
tracing the shock fronts in the ultraviolet. We're still looking at that, working on the ultraviolet images out over here. So this is a UVIT composite uh, in the far ultraviolet over here. The S1 composite, uh, the, the composite in the, again, in the far ultraviolet. The brightest regions are ones that show the maximum, uh, maximum uh, excess in, in the, in the all the far ultraviolet, all the three far ultraviolet bands, and most probably contain emission from forbidden carbon four lines alongside various emissions from helium lines, etc. Over here, I would like to point out that S3 is the region that is very prominent because there was a XMM RGS pointing of this region, which by the way has been marked out over here in green circle, and the corresponding far ultraviolet image shows that there's a fairly uh, a fairly strong ultraviolet uh, excess in this region, far FUV excess in this region. This region is dominated by charge CX uh, oxygen 7 resonance line over here. And moving on to the X ray studies over here, um, we've, uh, okay, so we, we've done uh, uh, expect modeling of all the regions that we discuss out over here uh, that I mentioned out over here. And uh, as you can see out over here, it's while it's relatively easy to model just the, the small part of the spectrum from 0.5 to 0.7 keV, which is dominated by the CX reactions. When you try to include all the other, uh, all the, the the softer bands as well as a slightly harder region like the silicon bump at 2 keV, etc., models tend to become a lot more complicated. And we find that there is, there's, you can see the abundances out over here. There is a con there is obviously the oxygen contribution which uh, is which dominates out over here, and basically you our you find uh, in this particular case you find a lot of iron over here, nitrogen and oxygen. Moving on to S three, that is to say, moving a little bit north over here, we find that the that you almost always seem to require two component shock models rather than a single component shock model over here. S3, of course, also shows uh, ACS excess, as I mentioned. The S8 region over here, where uh, the deviation, again, is attributed to charge exchange. The, in other regions, however, you find that there is very little contribution from charge exchange reaction itself and trying to model charge exchange plus the the various shock components becomes ex exceedingly difficult. The models don't fit very well. So we're still working. It's still a work in progress. We're trying to expand our ex our uh, modeling to these regions. Moving on to NGC 6995, we find suddenly that we need actually three temperature models, three temperature shock models in order to fully model the X-ray emission from this region. I think I'm coming close to the end of this talk. So I'll end here and please send me the questions on Slack. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now Ildar Habibulin will talk about new radio frame supernova remnants discovered by the Rosita. Yeah, can you see the slides? Can you hear me? Uh, Okay, great. So I'll give you a few highlights on the new supernova remnants that we have discovered uh, recently in the data of the Erasita All Sky Survey, namely uh, the G116 here on the left and G121 here on the right. They are all big and they feature um, a very soft X-ray spectrum, and also probably not surprisingly, they are also very radio faint. Okay, so probably you have seen already this picture many times. So it's uh, the off-sky image obtained by Irazita after the uh, one off-sky um, scan. And now we have four scans and the typical exposure time per every point is around one kilosecond. And the detection limit for point sources is a few uh, 10 to minus 14. And there are something like few million point sources uh, and mildly extended sources here on this map. But uh, of course, there are lots of other things also. And uh, these uh, things like North Pole, Spore and the Eurozita bubbles and so on. But when we uh, go and extract, um, uh, when we first detect and then mask 
uh, all the point sources, we start uh, seeing even uh, fainter structures. And here is the first example, G116, which is located somewhere here, not far away from the Andromeda galaxy on the sky. So uh, here on the right, you see a picture which is approximately eight degree on this size. And then we see this faint, almost circular emission, which is uh, four degrees in the diameter. And um, its uh, emission is dominated in the, by the oxygen lines and its brightness is approximately 20% of the background emission. So it's very faint. And we, if we take a more quantitative uh, look at this, so here is the radio profile, red is without background subtraction and the blue one when the background level was subtracted. So we see some uh, quite mildly age brightened profile and it goes all the way to approximately two degrees. And the spectrum is shown here on the right. The uh, red is without the background subtraction and blue is again after the background was subtracted. And it's, uh, it can be fit with the uh, just APEC model with a temperature around 0.2 kV with the abundance of neon being twice uh, larger than the solar value compared to oxygen. Uh, but also you can describe it with the non-equilibrium model with the tau parameter around four, 10 to nine or so. All right, so uh, we then also uh, checked the publicly available LOFAR data and found the counterpart in the uh, low frequency radio waves. It's very, very faint. And if we put uh, now this source on the Sigma D diagram, uh, it's so it will be very, very low here on the uh, low right part of, of this diagram, assuming some fiducial distance of three kiloparsec or so. So our interpretation is this is a supernova 1A remnant that exploded somewhere in the gas of the galactic halo, three kiloparsec away from us and one kiloparsec from the disk. So the density of the ambient medium is very low. So we are uh, deep in the non-equilibrium uh, ionization and uh, non-equilibrium electron ion state. So we can really study all these processes there and we can also probe the parameters of the gas uh, in, in this medium. All right, so now to the second one. Uh, this supernova remnant is located now in the disk, not far away from Taika. So it's uh, at uh, the lat latitude minus two. So it's also quite circular and half a degree in diameter. So, but it uh, features quite a different spectral morphology. So the the band that is dominated by oxygen is mostly edge brightened and the band that is dominated by iron and neon it's more centrally peaked so it is uh, you can see here on the radio profiles so for iron we have centrally peak and for oxygen we have edge brightened and it can well be described by the non equilibrium ionization models uh, requiring some overabundance of iron in the center and some overabundance of neon in the outer part and for this one, we fail to find any counterpart in optical or radio band. So you don't need to, to see here that just shows that we extensively checked all the data, but fail to find anything. So our interpretation is that it is also one A supernova that exploded somewhere in the outer galaxy something like nine kiloparsec away from us. So it's 30,000 uh, years old. And we are also deep in the ion electron and ionization non-equilibrium states here. So here are my conclusions. I just give you a few highlights on the new supernova remnants discovered by Sergi Irazita. And uh, they are, of course, very different from the, uh, the population that is known already right now, just by definition, uh, because otherwise they would have been found already. And they are also very interesting in terms of the physics that allow us to probe. Okay, and you can check the details in, in those papers. Thanks. Now we have the last talk, last lightning talk of this session. It is by Hidetoshi Sano, who will talk about shock, shock cloud interaction in the supernova. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity to make this talk today. So this is Hidetoshi Sano of Kyoto University from Japan. So today, so I'd like to talk about shock cloud interaction in supernova remnant revealed by Chandra and Aruma. Okay. So first I emphasize that shock interaction with clumpy gaseous medium is important in understanding the high energy uh, phenomena in supernova remnants. 
So uh, before the super of explosion, so strong stellar wind evacuate low density H1 gas and create an expanding wind shell whose inside density is about 0.01 per cubic centimeter. But on the other hand, dense molecular clouds, okay, here uh, can survive erosion because of their high density is greater than thousand per cubic centimeter. Then the highly inhomogeneous density distribution is therefore expected as an initial condition before the supernova explosion, okay? So then a uh, supernova explosion occurs. So the dense clouds terminate the water shocks and the turbulent magnetic field will be enhanced up to milligrams on the surface of the shocked cloud. So this with the synchrotron X-ray limb brightening surrounding the cloud, okay? So the reflected shocks also re-accelerate cosmic rays and efficiently heat up supernova ejecta. So here, so I'll introduce our recent combining studies using Aruma CO and Chandra X-ray to review such physical processes. Okay, so let's move to the first source, RH7030. I think you love and that my love, okay? So this synchrotron X-ray bright supernova remnant is now interacting with dense molecular clouds traced by CO in magenta contours. So Uchiyama et al. 2007 revealed the short time variability of X-ray hotspots in northwest of RC7030. So by considering uh, cooling and acceleration time scale, the X-ray hotspots show the high magnetic field of one milligas at 10 arc sec scale. So if the magnetic field is amplified by the shock crowd interaction, so we can find tiny CO crowds in the vicinity of the X-ray hotspots, okay? So then we observe the CO at full arc sec resolution using ARMA. So this is the result. So left panel shows the Arma CO image of the same region as shown by Uchiyama et al. 2007. And other panel shows the X-rays in each observing epoch. So we found that X-ray hotspots are associated with the shock survived CO crowd rates with a size of about 0.05 per sec and a density of 10 to the fourth per cubic centimeter. So this indicates that the strong magnetic field and X-ray hot uh, X-ray short time variation were generated by the shock crowd rate interaction, okay? So next source is the Magionic Supernova Remnant N1323, which is the X-ray brightest Supernova Remnant in the LMC. So we found crumpy CO clouds in green, so near the center of the Supernova Remnant. So because the intensity ratio of CO322 over one to zero is a good indicator of the shock heated crowd, so we confirm that the CO clouds inside the supernova remnant are physically associated with n 132 d So to review the physical processes of the shock crowd interaction, so we extracted X-ray spectra from uh, shock crowd F and intercrowd region. So the left panel shows the X-ray spectroscopic result. I think, uh, okay, so of the two regions. So we found that lack of VT shock component towards the crowd F. So we conclude that the flood shock has been completely terminated towards the crowd reaction. So we propose that the ISM morphology based or physical property based X-ray spectroscopy is needed to better understand the thermal X-ray production, okay? So the final uh, source is the Magionic Supernova Remnant N63A. So we reveal the CO crowds in green. So embedded within the shock ionized H-alpha nebula in red. So the CO and H-alpha detected area spatially corresponds to the shadow of the soft band X-rays due to the interstellar absorption. Oh, sorry. So using Chandra, so we found the hard X-ray excess toward the shocked crowd region. So this can be reproduced not only by the high temperature plasma efficiently heated by the reflected shock, but also the synchrotron X-ray due to the magnetic field amplification. In any case, shock crowd interaction plays an important role in understanding the X-ray spectra. So this is summary of my talk. I think time is up. So please send me comments and suggestions uh, using Slack and or by email. Thank you for your attention. I just thank all speakers of this session. <laughs>
Okay, that concludes this session, and we have a break until 4 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we we rest here or we we contact. Uh, you, you can yeah, you can leave this session, or I can move you to the attendees. Okay, thank you.
Hi, Margarita. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You you mute it. It shows you mute it. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. So shall I try? Yeah, you can go ahead and try to share your slides. Here, let me see. I had some trouble earlier. Share screen. Uh, pick the screen. Share, and then, and then. I, uh, I do view, I do view, slideshow, I do uh, new share. Uh, do you see? Uh, yes, I do. That looks great. Do you want to advance a slide or two? Yeah. Okay, perfect. That looks great. It's working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, just mute mute your uh, mute your microphone until your your turn comes up. I stop share. No, yeah, I stop, stop share. share. Yeah. yeah, stop share. I mute my mouth. Great. <laughs> uh, I can't hear you. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you very much. So oh, I yeah, just no stay worries. put here. Yeah, stay put. Uh, you can turn your camera off if you want and until we start until we start your talk. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.